dear Julia, I am again fully well. I have had the diarrhea for several weeks and an inclination to chills and fevers. We are all in status quo. Don't know when we will move. Troops are constantly arriving so that I will soon have a very large army. A big fight may be looked for some place before a great while, which it appears to me will be the last in the West. This is all the time supposing that we will be successful, which I never doubted for a single moment. I heard of your arrival at Louisville several days ago, through some steamboat captain, and before your letter was received, stating that you would start the next day. All my staff are now well, though most of them have suffered same as myself. Rollins and myself, both being very unwell at the same time, made our labors hard upon us. All that were with me at Cairo are with me here, substituting Dr. Brinton for Dr. Simmons, and, in addition, Captain Hawkins and Captain Rowley. Rowley has also been very unwell. Captain Hillier will probably return home and go to Washington. His position on my staff is not recognized, and he will have to quit or get it recognized. Captain Brink is in the same category. All the slanders you have seen against me originated away from where I was. The only foundation was from the fact that I was ordered to remain at Fort Henry and send the expedition under command of Major General Smith. 28. This was ordered because General Halleck received no report from me for near two weeks after the fall of Fort Donelson. The same occurred with me, I received nothing from him. The consequence was, I apparently totally disregarded his orders. The fact that he was ordering me every day to report the condition of my command. I was not receiving the orders, but knowing my duties was reporting daily, and when anything occurred to make it necessary, two or three times a day. When I was ordered to remain behind, it was to cause much astonishment among the troops of my command, and also my disappointment. When I was again ordered to join them, they showed, I believe, heartfelt joy. Knowing that for some reason I was relieved of the most important part of my command, the papers began to surmise the cause, and the abolition press, the New York Tribune particularly, was willing to hear no solution not unfavorable to me. Such men, such as Kuntz, busy themselves very much. I never allowed a word of contradiction to go out from my headquarters, thinking this is the best course. I know, though I do not like to speak of myself, that General Halleck would regard this army badly off if I was relieved. Not but where there are generals with it abundantly able to command, but because it would have leave inexperienced officers senior in rank. You need not fear, but I will come out triumphantly. I am pulling no wires, as political generals do, to advance myself. I have no future ambition. My object is to carry on my part of this war successfully, and I am perfectly willing that others may make all the glory they can out of it. Give my love to all at home. Kiss the children for me. Ulysses. Having taken Fort Henry from the Confederates, Union forces under the commander Ulysses S. Grant moved deeper into Tennessee on steamships going through the Tennessee River, disembarking at Pittsburgh Landing. Setting up camp, Grant waits for General Beale's army of the Ohio to link up. Meanwhile, the newly formed army of Mississippi under Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston marches towards the encamped Union forces. The Confederacy hopes to push Union troops out of Tennessee. Though his troops are poorly armed and inexperienced in combat, General Johnson hopes a quick surprise can lead to a victory in pushing out federal troops. However, heavy rains have made the roads muddy and slows down the troops while also getting soldiers stuck in the mud. By chance, a Union night patrol spots the marching Confederate lines and a small skirmish breaks out between them. Gunfire can be heard from a distance, alerting Grant and the Union Army. Union troops prepare and begin making battle lines before the coming Confederate Army gets near. Confederate line infantry begin marching towards Union positions. 
General Johnston decides to personally lead his Confederates into battle. Both sides exchange intense musket fire. Some of the Confederate line, though disorganized, manage to push back the Union army. In one position, the exchange of fire is so intense that accounts from soldiers describe the sound of many balls in the air was like hearing a dozen angry hornets, giving this position the nickname the Hornet's Nest. More than 50 cannons under Confederate General Daniel Ruggles rains down artillery upon the Hornet's Nest for several hours. During the battle, General Albert Sidney Johnston is wounded by musket fire. He ignores the wound while leading. However, Johnston later bleeds to death. The Hornet's Nest is surrounded by enemy forces and falls to the Confederates. Grant's troops fall back. Even though the Confederates have taken Union positions, they have been exhausted, giving Grant and his troops time to form new defensive positions near Pittsburgh Landing. Pittsburgh is defended by Union artillery, and in the Tennessee River, Union gunboats stand by ready. Union reinforcements later arrive. It is the Army of the Ohio. During the night, a thunderstorm swept through the battlefield, making both sides miserable while they got drenched in the storm. On the second day, the Union Army begins to move its battle lines towards the Confederate Army. The Confederate lines, disorganized, begins to fall back. Past positions become engulfed in musket fire once again. Throughout the day of the battle, the Confederates realize that they cannot achieve the victory they had hoped for and begin a withdrawal toward Corinth. Bringing an end to two days of fighting, the Battle of Shiloh finally ended in a Union victory. Dear Julia, Again, another terrible battle has occurred in which our arms have been victorious. For the number engaged and the Tennessee with which both parties held on for two days, during an incessant fire of musketry and artillery, it has no equal on this continent. The best troops of the rebels were engaged to the number of 162 regiments, as stated by a deserter from their camp, and their ablest generals. 29. Beauregard commanded in person aided by A.S. Johnson, Bragg, Breckinridge, and hosts of other generals of less note, but possibly of quite as much merit. General Johnson was killed, and Bragg wounded. 30. The loss on both sides was heavy, probably not less than 20,000 killed and wounded altogether. 31. The greatest loss was sustained by the enemy. They suffered immensely by demoralization. Also, many of their men leaving the field who will not again be of value on the field. I got through all safe, having but one shot, which struck my sword, but did not touch me. I am detaining a steamer to carry this and must cut it short. Give my love to all at home. Kiss the children for me. The same for yourself. Good night, dear Julia. Ulysses.